This is the Check for Traps podcast, looking to hump the ears of one Mr. Haruki Murakami. Call us now. Today, me and Aaron are going to be discussing uh, the new movie Burning, directed by Lee Chang Dong and starring Yu A In and Zhong Chong Xiu and uh, Stephen Yen of The Walking Dead fame. Apologies for pronunciation if that, if that was wrong. But I we, tried we think so hard. We think that's right. We watched Burning. So many films came out this week. We had Green Book to go see. Yeah. We had Vice to go see. If Beale Street could talk, yeah. mm. can you ever forgive me? And we decided to go watch Burning. And I'm really glad we did. I do not regret it for a second. Come, we come at different points here. There was a serious flaw in it for me that you didn't seem to find as, as annoying or annoying at all. However, I think overall, especially in the days following it, I was messaging you and it was like, oh wow, that was not only good on the surface, there was a lot going on that I didn't even really click at the time. Okay, what we want to do is give you a quick review mm. before we get sort of like deep into it because I... I don't think this is a film you want to spoil any aspect of. I went into it literally just knowing that it's an adaptation, a Murakami short story that I've not read and not that I did not want to read, and I'm glad I did that. There's worse ways to spend two hours and 30 minutes. Or... Yeah, yeah, it was, quite, it was quite long. It's the longest, uh, I think, so, you know, everyone always said The, the Hobbit was the longest adaptation of any, mm-hmm. any comparison to pages. Yeah, yeah, page I think length this, to run time. I, I think, think this has exceeded it. it. From 13 pages into two and a half hours is some real value extraction. In the words of Bilbo, like butter scraped across too much bread. Flash of a big spoiler sign here. Go go watch it, you damn kids. It's it's a good movie. It's an interesting movie. You won't see anything like it. A Japanese short story adapted into a Korean contact. Perfectly. Really nicely. Into the perk. And that's going to be, yeah, the thing we spoke to speak about the most. But yeah, so spoilers. Spoilers. So, let's get out the bingo card. <laughs> While Aaron's doing that, as we've said, this is adapted from a short story by Haruki Murakami, who, me and Aaron, Aaron's more in love with him than me, but we've had something of a parallel yeah, we, in him. we, we undertook him. a pact to read some Murakami each, because mm. we both heard about him when neither of us had uh, read, read him. For years, avoiding him almost. A third person also took that pact. That's correct. The, who, <laughs> and the ghost in the room. <laughs> the ghost in the shell. You really liked the book that you read? The two books? Well, I, mean, I read it. was Norwegian Wood, yep. Pinball, oh, yes, no, sorry, Sing, of course, sorry, and like Five in the end. Yep. Yeah, yeah. So it is, yeah. Sorry, because yeah. your packed book running, wasn't it? How... Oh, that's right. That was a really interesting one as well. So yeah, we, we got into it, and he's a he's a tropey guy. And he I has, don't he has his... Way. So he has uh, many staples. Obviously, if you know Murakami, you're gonna, you know what's coming next. Mm. If not, then I think this is just quite fun that any writer could develop such like a bunch of cast iron tropes, but they yeah. all seem roughly unrelated. It, it was fun, uh, I think, for us, because even though this is an adaptation of his work, it, it stands completely on his own, but to have seen the Murakami-isms inherited so comfortably into something new in popular culture... They worked. You know, yeah, yeah. They, they did, and I want more of it, because I really enjoyed watching his themes on screen. But also it through a filter, well. like, they didn't get boring because there was also a new context to it, which is the best type of adaptation you can do, mm. is when you sort of inject something new, a new take, and it works really well. I don't know if maybe it's just it works so naturally because it's... Another East Asian country, mm. another well, quite you know well developed East Asian country like East from Japan. This mm. is Korea, but it's slotted in so nicely. I'm just going to say that the big ones for me that remind me I was in a Murakami verse were commitment to scenes of weird masturbation. Yep. Weirdly enough, masturbation is not on here. I don't know if it's because it's a PG-13 bingo board <laughs> <laughs> for all those preteen Murakami enthusiasts out there um, reading their evangelical edited versions of the books. Go from sort of like left to right down and we'll answer whether we think they've arrived. Mysterious woman? Yes. Yep. Big tick. Bing. Ear fetish? No. No, no though, ear stuff in this one. Though, though, which is uh, interesting, yeah. Mm. I, I'm, I was kind of disappointed. She had nice ears. You could have, uh, you could have done nice something ears, with that. But, you know, if, if they were really going to go the full Murakami, we would have had paragraphs of exposition about said ears. Dried up well? Yep. Huge. Bing, big big tick. <laughs> big tick on dried up well. <laughs> something vanishing? Yes. Yep. Quite a bit. Several things. Yeah. Feeling of being followed. Weirdly enough, he does the following in this more than being followed. He does. But he's also very paranoid and he's actively mm. followed at one point. He do- yeah, well, mm. he gets the tables turned on him at one point as well. So. Unexpected phone call? Yep, he gets, yep. He gets howled. How did? Cats? Yep. Big. Tick. Old jazz records? Yes. Yep. Though weirdly, our protagonist is not a fan of jazz in this one. Which no, is, uh, but they, they bust it out during the dancing scene. No, they buy in the cafe as well. Oh, There's yeah. A, but that's what I mean. But normally, it's not the. In this time, it's the bad guy who likes jazz. Mm. And normally, it's obviously our fucky <laughs> Murakami protagonist. Sketches of Spain vinyl. This is walking around downtown Tokyo, being like, I just love Miles Davis so much. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Urban Ennui? Yep. Big Tick. Supernatural Powers? Not so much. No. Surprisingly grounded. One time. Running. Yes. Yeah. Lots of running. He's running from greenhouse to greenhouse. There is. Secret passageway? Mm, no, no secret really. passageway. What a shame. Train station? 
No, no. Lots of cars. Cars is the one. Yeah, yeah. He's yeah, driving big, around everywhere. Big into rickety vans. Oh, sorry. We, our, our intern has just uh, just she's, she's been listening to us recording, and um, she points out that there is a bit of supernatural in there. The whole oh, the, yeah. Ken, the Kenya dance. Thank you. Thank you Holy very much. Shit. Nice one. So yeah, no, there, there is a there's a, that is actually a, a bingo across the row. Historical flashback. No, no, again, not really. Though they do mention a, a, a bit about Korea's history and Korea's mm. history of China. Nothing about Korea's history of Japan, which I thought was really interesting. Yeah, yeah. I, I was wondering if that was going to come up. Considering it's awkward, it was funded, as I saw in the credits, by uh, NHK. I was like, well, I guess they probably weren't. The NHK being the Japanese version of the BBC, essentially. Okay. I, I guess they weren't too interested in. <laughs> <laughs> In Japan bashing. They could bash true Korea all they wanted, and they did. Precocious teenager? She was recently, I, I, she, uh, Hey May, the girl, was probably mm. recently a precocious teenager. Yeah. But no, she's definitely graduated from there. Cooking? Yes. He's preparing food. They talk about cooking. Yeah. They talk about pasta. Oh. He gets really annoyed because he listens to jazz and eats pasta. That's, that was hilarious. He was a cunt, wasn't he? I mean, even even prior to the possible murder. And that's Josh just talking about Stephen Young. That's not even the... Uh, oh yeah, not even the character. That's not the character. Mm. He just, uh, just really dislikes him. Fuck that guy. Speaking to cats. Yep. yep. Parallel worlds? No, no, not really. Unless you count North Korea as a dark parallel world. Weird sex? That's a... Yes. That's a bingo. That is a bingo. <laughs> Kid chip cover? No. Tokyo at night? Not, uh, not no. unfair. I mean, there is soul at night. Don't. Tokyo at night's a bit unfair as far as a trope. Well, I mean, he's he's, he's from Japan yeah. and it's night time. He's resided in Tokyo the... <laughs> for quite a lot of his life, and yet it's often night time. <laughs> yeah, you're right. Maybe that's yeah. a bit punitive. I, I think that's a bit douchey, <laughs> but yeah. Unusual name. I would agree with this one. I think that, uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna talk about this later. But the name Ben. It's really important that he's called Ben. It, I would mm. agree. Faceless villain. Not so much. He is. He has a facade. Yeah. He he is definitely. We're not seeing his true face. He is, yeah. He is mysterious. And then finally, Vanishing Cats, which, uh, ding, ding, bing, pow. That, that is a, you know, that, that's a bingo. So yeah, as far as the short story goes, in 13 pages, it seems like Murakami gets up to lots of his old tricks. That's right. I'm excited to read it. I'm probably Maybe he has it. this on his wall. <laughs> <laughs> it's inspiration. Yeah. I would. If someone made that, I'd be quite endeared that someone went through It'd my work nice. and picked out where I was being lazy. He seems like a nice guy. Yep. Mm. I, I, so yeah, that's our history of Mr. Murakami. We're quite quite familiar with his work. I haven't seen. This is the first adaptation. I know there's been a couple. They're few and far between. There's, what, there's, there's like Norwegian one from the nineties. There's um, a couple in the early two thousands, and I think this is basically it since the Norwegian wood one. Yeah, I, want to say. I think that's from what the the middle to late noughties. The problem is, is that none of them seem particularly well regarded, and I get the impression with him, much like with the beat books, actually, up until you know around the last ten years, where people started trying to adapt them quite seriously or adapt the, the author's lives quite seriously, that I don't think the right person with the right passion for Murakami has been getting hold of these things just yet. I think they've been adapting them because they're popular books, but they need someone who really gets it. You, you know what I mean? No, but, I, I'd yeah. agree. In my opinion, I don't screen. think they translate well to screen. You've got to, and you've got to really think about it. And they clearly did for this one. Mm. And especially because they were only adapting 13 pages, that probably benefited them more than anything because they didn't, mm. you know, at a certain point, you just don't have a structure. You you have a... And I think if you tried to adopt, especially some of those longer ones, like if you tried to adopt Wind Up Bird, even South of the Border, West of the Sun, I yeah. think you would run into some real troubles with just how you pace it. And you, th you think that this had some big pacing issues. I agreed with you, to be fair, to an extent. I said the th last third was unnecessarily long. Mm. I think for you it kicked in about the halfway mark. Well, uh, yeah, it was more, it kind of, it began then, but it was only retrospectively that I decided once I'd seen more of it. The problem is, is it was on its surface, it was supposed to be quite suspenseful, but I don't feel like there, were, that, there was enough actual progress for the character with regards to what he was discovering or what he wasn't discovering. I think it was kind of treading water without realizing it was treading water. I'd agree. I mean, yeah. he, so I, I actually think that he kind of does the development he needs to hmm. pretty quickly. Yeah. After she disappears, he becomes active rather than passive. Hmm. Cause up until then, like uh, Jaime and Ben are both acting upon Johnson yeah, yeah. Uh, and they are and he is just sort of like along for the ride and obviously once he disappears then it's once he's got there once he's being active he doesn't he isn't progressing anymore yeah and he is just he's like trying to solve a murder that he's not sure has happened mm. I, guess, I guess is the, the best way to put it but I think I think that's really compelling and I think it probably could have been quite easily fixed no okay, massively yeah. so I mean yeah I think you could easily trim down that I think you probably even do it with just the existing footage I don't think you'd need to uh mm. I'm, ha I'm happy at the length, I think, and I do think it gets very tense by the end. Like mm. by the time, like the police car is passing him, and then he's like getting these phone calls, increasing phone calls. Mm. He's increasingly alone. Like there's a bit where you realize he just hasn't spoken to anyone in ages, um, and it's I think it's punctuated by when he goes for like a job interview really quickly and then just leaves. Yeah. <laughs> 
Um, oh, I'd forgotten about that bit. That was that was a really good bit. I liked that as a way of showing that Jong Su kind of was trying to move on, but then completely failed. Oh yeah, he, really, really quickly. As like, soon as he realised that, you know, as soon as he was confronted with like the first obstacle, which was just like, "What's your name?" Yeah, he was like, "Well, <laughs> he, he was like, num- he came to his number, and he'd been asking all of them in sequence the same question, you know, like, how far away do you live, and can you work late nights and weekends, and." Just as soon as he was asked, he was like, ah, fuck this. Yeah, he's, I'm trying to solve a disappearance here. <laughs> yeah, he's like, I've got other things to focus on. As well as that, he's juggling Trial of His Father, mm. which I, I really enjoyed. That was I, interesting. I, I, I thought until the end of this, and uh, until the end of this, I thought that the father scenes were quite pointless, but then sort of like, as the as it hits its climax, they suddenly really made sense to me, mm. and I really liked them, and I, they really underpin his character, and sort of like... Even, like, his sister and his mother, who barely, well, sister doesn't appear at all, and mm. mother very briefly. Yeah. I think they all sort of, like, really helped determine why Jong Su is like he is. Hmm. The, it's really nice. I, re- I like the father stuff a lot, just because, as, as far as a challenge in character building, everything that you learnt about him uh, was through what other people were saying. Like, he was a completely silent character, yep. even to the point where uh, w- uh, his lawyer actually tries to make Jong Su confront him and make him put in a guilty plea or whatever... And you, makes him apo- wants him to apologize. Yeah, that's, yeah. That, that's all he wants him to do. He's like, mm. he just refuses to apologize to the person that he assaulted. You, you might think in that situation we'd finally get a one-to-one confrontation between the two. They don't let you have it because he's a stoic guy and he he's not going to back down. It's almost fitting that uh, Jong Su kind of only sees his father from you know like across the dock while things are happening to him. Yep. Because he's he, he's he's almost um he's like abdicated his agency in that situation. He won't apologize, and people are going to decide what they're going to do with him. And it, and again, I think it's part of the sort of situation that he's put in because you get to you never experience the father at the farm, hmm. but you get a, this. This film is like sort of detailed enough that you obviously see the farm. He goes around getting a petition signed where mm. people talk about how they feel about his father and they say that his father was miserable. Mm. And they live on the North Korean border, which is yep. obviously an incredibly precarious place to live. Mm. Um, and has dramatic, has constant propaganda streaming across it. Mm. I, I, I can entirely understand why this government official coming down was the last straw for him. Mm. I didn't... and I, 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 I For a character who you never hear talk, mm. the film is competent enough that it builds everything around him he feels like another part of the world, and you understand him, despite the fact that it never really focuses on him for more than minutes at a time. Mm. So Aaron, tell me how you feel. What do you think the significance of his father's struggle is for jong Su as a character, and the decision he makes at the end to kill Ben? Like, having witnessed his father be, be, be ground down by the state, and by mm. sort of like the, 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 the situation mm. in South Korea as a whole, witness this, this man, Ben, who commits these crimes, in his mind and gets away with them yeah. and just acts with such impunity and lives such a good life is just more than he mm. can take I think that and, and knows that that's how he lives yeah, and boasts yeah, about it yeah, and boasts well. about it and like he gets to and gets to like just gets to live the easiest life by doing no work he's not fair to him it's not fair to him that his father he's, he's pushed to the brink in mm. the same system that rewards Ben for being a murderer and also I think what's important is it because they talk about his father being normal normal normmal violent yeah and I think obviously that's in Jong Soo like, yeah cl- clearly hereditary and I, I think that's what that w- w- the second he stabbed him I was like it's an angry an angry working class boy who's like sort of witnessed his his mother and father be ground on by the same system that's mm. rewarded this person and at that point it became almost sort of like, like a a socialist fairy tale, or mm. not a fairy tale, like a parable almost. Yeah. Nice is not a good enough word. It was really great. Like it was perfect mm. in in that moment. Like uh, he just enacts like a, a generation, or two generations worth of violence mm. upon this rich bastard who, again, and I, I'm gonna you know put my chips on him, may or may not even deserve it. Like like I said, it's yeah. a murder mystery where you're not sure if a murder's been committed, mm. and you can have your own opinions on it. Like, like I said, I think it was committed. I think you agree with me. No, he doesn't really care. He just he knows that this man needs to die. But th- this is the point of the. <laughs> This is what's good. It's the two the two levels of guilt. There's the assumed. This is, this is what was like fun for me about this movie is that you know I enjoyed it. Obviously, I had some serious pacing issues in the second half, but we're just going to stop talking about that now. So I, I liked it. I was enjoying kind of the set dressing. That's what I mean. I, I liked the way that it was painting an accurate picture of a place in the world for me. 
but it was only the day after. Oh, it's the class thing. It's just a massive class thing. Because I mean, it was there, you know, after I saw the movie, it was very much just a revenge killing. Oh, was that for... so? Was the, oh, so you, as I was watching it, that's all I was thinking about. Well, maybe, was, that's, maybe that's what engaged me so much. Is like I was just like, this is. So I, I didn't get it to the point where I thought it was class. I thought that the class was important, and the fact the significance of the murder with regards to that being a culmination of all of the class issues was not something that clicked in with me until the next day. But in, maybe a, in I'm a just, good way. Maybe I'm just thinking about class more often than you. Always. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But no, it was, um, it was no, because no, but, the, yeah. the film front-loaded a motivation for the murder. That, that was, yeah, that was beyond class. It, it was, was exactly. And it wasn't a dick about its themes. That's why it, it let me think about it and then conclude. It, it wasn't, wasn't It wasn't heavy-handed, no, I agree. But mm. equally, it wasn't heavy-handed, but it did permeate every aspect of the film, mm. which is such a hard balancing act to No get. idea how, mate. Uh, um, uh, and, it, and it's magnificent, because even from the second you first meet Ben, to me, I was just like, this is rural farmer, you know, impoverished farmer versus city sort of mm. asshole. Every time you saw him happy, Ben, or not even happy, more just kind of like smarmy. Because well, like you know he's not happy, because he's already admitted yeah. he can't feel emotion. Yeah. That's what made that, and I'm so glad they front loaded that. Like, mm. that's one of the first things he says to them both. He's like, I don't cry. And I don't think he, I think on the reverse spectrum, I don't think he really feels happiness. Because there's some really nice scenes when he's, so he, so Ben, he meets women and he sort of parades them around in front of his rich friends. I don't know, what would you say the common theme between his women now? I'd say they, they travel, hmm. they're not rich, no, they're not smart. They're aspiring, and mm. they and he's bored by them. He yawns a lot. He, mm. Whenever they're on screen, whenever they're talking, whenever they have the center stage, and everyone else is really interested, he's like smiling at Jong Su and just yawning and mm. like really bored. He doesn't but respect them in the slightest. They hammered that home a lot. Well, I don't think he even remote really likes them. That actually links in with the exhibitionist aspect of him, which I really liked, in that he could have done all of this under the radar, but he liked people to see it was happening, and he like it was like that over wealth thing. It's like I am this rich. You know, there is exploitation going on here, but there is literally nothing you can do about it. Yeah. When he's just giving that, and he's the perfect character, he's the perfect actor for the Roma, I say, mm. his little shit eating grin. But I never. Like, I wanted to stab him. I was. Uh... He, he was. So, Stephen Young was great in this. I had no idea that he had this in him, because I obviously only know him as Glenn, which is, obviously it's not his fault, but Glenn in The Walking Dead is just beyond a meme of annoyance. And please, Josh, you, you also know him as the would be, uh, the would be bull of Sorry to Bother You. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah, yeah, he did it again. <laughs> like, yeah, now he's suddenly he's coming in. He's here to steal your girlfriend. He's, also uh, he's, something about socialism. This is, yeah, this is... <laughs> yeah, he's like, <laughs> he's like, vague working rights message yeah, yeah. plus gonna For steal Colvin. your girlfriend. Well, I think this is the reason he left The Walking Dead, right? Is that he wanted to try and do... Yeah. Better or more interesting things, and I'm gonna say, man, like two for two, he's, out he's done more interesting things, especially here. I, I want, I wanted to talk to you about uh, just picking up or, or continuing more with the themes we were saying when Jong Su got the phone call from Hamey while he was at the farm saying that she was gonna come and visit again with that thing where he parades around in front of you. It had actually been Ben's idea. Ben had suggested they go and see Jong Su, oh, yeah, he... and his whole he, he's like, not only am I kind of gonna. Not steal your girlfriend, but you, not only have I kind of superseded you. Well, he's like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna hang around with the only person who mm. you know. Like he's like, yeah. I'm gonna be as important to this person as you are, yeah. and you have no one else, and I mm. have an entire life. But um, like, I will, I will make sure that this happens in front of you. Yeah. And then later on, after she goes missing, he makes it happen again with someone who he doesn't know. But as you said, he's yawning. He's looking right at Jong Su. He's like, you know what's happening here. Do you, do you think? Uh, do you think he was flirting with the idea that Jong Su was gonna enact retribution, or do you think it was I a surprise? Never crossed his mind. In no. my opinion, I, I don't think he. I don't think he'd have gone out there. I think the reason he went out there is because he thought Jong Su was still like desperately either looking for Hai Mei mm. to sort of like enjoy it a bit more. Okay. I honestly don't think he ever assumed he could be the victim. Mm. He has a routine. He's literally sort of like hit a rut of murder mm. he, he, every two months um, actually should we get on to the murder so I, yeah. I want, uh, so I want to uh, so I think what makes this murder mystery really interesting mm. is that I think there's a really plausible case and I'm going to try and convince you here but I uh, convince you something I don't believe in like a real contrarian mm. that the murder didn't happen and I think it's so the, obviously the first one is the draw full of stuff and mm. in this in, in after Jaime is disappeared then he finds the watch that yeah. bonded them both 
right at the, the beginning, beginning of the film. Yeah. He finds that in the drawer. Mm. Now, obviously, uh, the idea is that like that would be some sort of trophy drawer, like a serial ki- killer trinket. Yeah. But equally, I mean, I. I think that could be just like a miscellaneous drawer of drunk that girls have left at his mm. house. Like you could easily argue that's a drawer of just relationship, like former lovers have left stuff there. Well, it can it can still be a trophy thing. Well, yeah, but it's without just a, the murder. Yeah, exactly, that's what I mean. But but even yeah. le- even less than that, it could just be like, oh, another bloody girls left something here. Mm. I'll throw this in the drawer, I yeah. guess. Like you know, in case they want it. Mm. And that that's you know, there's a bunch of stuff. There's like little. There's like pins and there's like Fitbits and stuff in there. Yeah. There's like nothing that anyone would, you know, it's stuff that people could easily forget about and yeah. not value. And again, with the cat, I honestly think that if Jaime was running away from credit card debt, as we know she's incurred, yeah, yeah. to get plastic surgery, mm. Stephen Yun even, uh, Ben even hints to this. She's like, I don't think she's gone on a trip, but she has gone away. Which is one way you would probably use to describe someone if they decided to run away from credit card debt. Mm. Well, it's, it's um, like how in this country we have, he's gone away for a while, which yeah. means they're in fucking jail. <laughs> they think that, you know, she would be like, well, I don't want to give jong Su the cat. Mm. I guess I'll give it to Ben. Like, especially if they had had a relationship or something at that point. And yeah, then yeah. she disappears. And then he doesn't want to tell jong Su about the cat, because mm. he's like, well, I'll probably hurt the guy quite a lot. Yeah. I think there's, eas- there's easily a scenario, I don't believe in it, but there's easily a scenario, I think, where he helped Jaime disappear. Yeah, yeah, just helped a ghost because the and well, but the the film wanted you to see that this was a possibility, and that's what was good about it. I mean, but I, yeah, with but, the with, oh yeah, I was just gonna say with the reappearance of Jong Su's mother, who had just left, just disappeared in you know not not too dissimilar circumstances with the immediacy of it, uh, and you know she's back and she's just talking about how oh well they'll break down all the doors to you know if you owe like a certain amount. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, so she was also running from debt. She was also. But she needed money that John- Joyce mm. promised her, but didn't seem to have a way to deliver on it. I was wondering if it was something, not that he was actually going to financially benefit from killing Ben, but was it like I'm going to do this and somehow this will enrich me? I can help you. I don't know. I, I don't. I don't think he had a way. I think yeah. this. I think at this point he was. Uh, oh, oh, sorry. The intern just come in with an average. Oh my god. He, he sold the cow. That's the money he got. The calf, by the way, um, I did some research into this because I assumed there was some symbolism there. Mm. I actually have it for you, you know, on, uh, here on Bernie Explained. Is it a sacrificial calf? No, actually, because that doesn't exist in Korean symbology. Oh. Um, it's a symbol of purity. Him selling it, it obviously just literally precedes his murder of Ben. Okay. And so it's sort of like him giving up on any sense of purity. It's like when you start selling your underpants to perverts. Exactly. We've all been Which there. we've done. Yeah. Like, yeah. It's actually how we afforded this microphone. Oh, it's yeah. Horrible. Jesus Christ. I had to go on so many jogs in those things. <laughs> Sometimes I send them back if they're not sweaty enough. Wow, you have some exacting clients. <laughs> <laughs> they're very demanding. Well, it's a saturated market. I guess so. I mean, you know, it's quite literally. Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, we missed it. So we've gone moved on to Burning Explained. I want to tell you, so you talked about the box office. And obviously this one's been quite successful. That's right. As far as sort of Kore- uh, Korean films go in the West. Do you want to know how well it did in Korea? Oh, where do you think where do you think it debuted in Korea? Or debuted, yeah. Debuted? <laughs> debuted, yeah. Debuted. Debuted. That was amazing. Yeah, um, no. Oh shit, was it like right at the bottom? Do they not care about Stephen Yun at all? Do they think he's a traitor? <laughs> no, they they do they, they care about Stephen Yun. I just don't think so some, so so, so hmm. this film lost out to two other films. It debuted for debuted. Jesus Christ. You got this I, man. I've got it stuck in my head now. Yeah, no. It doesn't feel right. You're great at English. Debuted. Debuted. Oh. Third, back in uh, back in back in May of last year, April May. Oh, okay. So it couldn't have been like Holmes and Watson or something. Um, <laughs> I would love it. If, <laughs> this, if like in South Korea, Holmes and Watson was tremendously yeah, popular. Yeah. <laughs> it is the greatest Western achievement we have ever seen. Oh, I did the voice for fuck's sake. We rank it behind the steam train. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and, the and, on, and only, and only that. Yeah. Uh, no, it, it lost out to two films. It lost out to first place box office Avengers: Infinity War. Okay. Second place box office Deadpool Two. Wow, that was an interesting you know, so, set of weekends some people had. So uh, yeah, yeah, I guess I guess someone might have gone and seen all three. Mm. Uh, but yeah, so apparently not not o- didn't overly care, didn't mm. do too well. But it's, you know, it uh, got put on the. Uh, the Academy shortlist. Okay. Uh, it got it's won loads of awards across the board, mainly again like Western awards. Yeah. I don't know. I guess maybe it's the popularity of Murakami. I would assume. Mm. I actually, you know what? I I don't know. I, mean, I I didn't see in the marketing for this. I didn't ever feel particularly hooked by the Murakami connection as much. It seemed to me to be Stephen Young because you have to remember, even though you feel like Stephen Young's not a household name, 
The Walking Dead is like the biggest TV show. And people know Glenn. People yeah. love Glenn. Like he's, he's kind of about as famous as you could be for like a Korean American actor. Yeah, it, it seems it's one of those things that I think that kind of. I guess it depends on your audience. Yeah, I guess, it. I guess it depends on your audience. Like maybe some people, yeah, some people, maybe you get a good cross section. It's either hmm. you get your Walking Dead fans and you get your Murakami fans. Yeah. I, I don't know how much interplay there is between those two audiences. But. Well, I mean, it's interesting that you say because obviously uh, my older brother. Uh, when I was younger, he showed me loads of Korean movies, Chinese movies, you know, Japanese movies, just you know, Asian cinema that was on film for. Like, it's not like it was the most obscure stuff. But, you know, he really ha he has a taste for that, as it were, um, but grew up into someone who's, you know, quite obsessed about The Walking Dead, more the comics, but he endures the show. No? Do you yeah. say endures or enjoys? I said endures. Oh, Jesus. Yeah. Also. <laughs> I'm always telling him to stop. No, that's fair. It's been years now. That's yeah, people. They should probably. I mean, AMC should probably stop. They really should. Anyway, back to back to Benny. Yeah, I wanted to get that across because I did think that was interesting that it didn't do quite as well as you'd think. It's just one of those things where sometimes you see an independent film that's got like one famous person in it, mm -hmm. and it kind of lifts the whole thing up a little bit as far as Marcus built it. Um, I wanted to ask you, Aaron, with regards to the relocation of the story, uh, Korea, South Korea, from Japan. You seemed very impressed by how they wove the culture and the recent history of South Korea into the story. Yeah, not, not only the recent history, but also mm. like the current problems, like we said, like mm. uh, the exploitation of K-pop stars and the very oppressive standards of beauty mm. um, for men and women. Uh, the massive rate of plastic surgery in Korea. I'm not, I didn't know that. The two, the two main speaking parts that we have by women have both had plastic surgery, mm. both his mother and Jaime. Obviously, uh, Jaime is also quite notice noticeably had plastic surgery on her breasts, and it really helped the story. Focused quite a lot on being called ugly, and then she changed that. And yeah, you said you, you didn't realize, but that's part of the whole feed in around K-pop and stuff. Like these people, these, these, there's such ridiculous pressure on in a very capitalist society, almost yeah. a more unrestrained capitalist society than the one we live in. Well, that that's the impression <laughs> I get. The more that you vex me with um, facts about South Korea, especially all the stuff you showed me about K-pop, I was like, it's like a more aggressive and brutal version of capitalism that, or well, what you read about like the film industry and stuff. In my head, I always picture that kind of really, really brutal, uh, brutal, aggressive beauty standards, people being worked into the ground, horrible contracts, as being kind of an overtly Western thing, but it seems to almost... I mean, it's not natural in any, any society, but it, it is a homegrown Western phenomenon. Yeah. And when you transplant that onto a, a culture that you replace the sort of, yeah, the sort of cultural traditions of, of, say, like East Asia with, I think it runs a bit more restrained, okay. uh, unrestrained and sort of a wrap. Um, tiny, tiny apartment. The apartment is very... Yeah, let's go on to the apartment, actually. Okay. Oh, no, I was just going to say, it was, it was getting me down. It also kind of made me feel glad this level of living like as an adult was being portrayed in media you know outside I don't know just like outside of what I'm familiar with like, because I know people who live like that and we've all kind of we've all lived like that I mean maybe maybe not in a place like that small but it's just that is actually so real that I want to see it everywhere because that, that that's the situation that people are living in yeah, that, yeah. And, you, and you don't I mean whenever you see I feel like whenever I see films these days, everyone has an apartment like Steven Yeun does. Yeah. Uh, or like at least, you know, approaching that size. Fucking ridiculous. But yeah, and obviously the, the window that she said there's no sunlight in this room, there's a there's a bit of every day for like a couple seconds off the, the back of the, the tower, tower, the salt, a, a reflection of some light and it comes through and it comes through first when they're having sex. That's right. And then every time when he's masturbating in her room thereafter. Mm. <laughs> I actually, like, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be base and juvenile about it. I was genuinely moved by when the two of them finally like consummated and then he looked just like a dirty patch of the wall and he saw this you know this blurry refraction of light from the soul tower fade in and fade out again it was beautiful it was, it was so real bloody lovely yeah it was in the worst possible well, way well that's what was funny because <laughs> yeah. like the, I, I was having this feeling that was like oh yeah poetry in motion then it was also he's hanging out the back of it right now but that was how it was. That was why it was real, and that's why it was but, effective. But, but also, just like he was looking at it like as a positive, but it's such a massive negative. Yes. Representing hope and representing like a glimmer, like mm. that's the one, the one thing that he has. And again, I think that's yeah, not to get too thematic, though you definitely can with this film. No, you should. The the little the little glimmer, the the, the all that he has, the mm. thing that obviously Stephen Yun's apartment has in spades because it's um it seems to be sort of like uh, east facing. It seems to get all the sun. Mm. Um, is like he has literally like sort of that little that little grasp of it while in the city and then obviously Jaime and it disappears I think that's what makes him ready to murder someone <laughs> I think I think it's just such a like he he's clearly very lonely at the beginning he doesn't mm. really talk to anyone he has he, you know like her he has no friends mm. which again is another you know, this, uh, we recently did a Vex Files on Mukbang 
uh, which is a, be a, coming out soon. a social phenomenon based entirely around being mm. quite lonely. Yeah, yeah. Um, and Wanting so, yeah, just two isolated people perhaps telling some falsehoods, perhaps mm. relying on some of the bad faith generated by the society. Yeah. They, they, they find a moment of solace in each other and then the system takes it away from them. So, with the light, you know, light, hope, whatevs. So, like, a Murakami thing sometimes, but just generally, she didn't even ever have a real light. Like, no. that, it was a reflection of light that caught off something like unattainable and like she, you know she only experienced like a part of what she was aspiring to through the prism of Ben yep. who killed her yep <laughs> yes, yeah this is the closest she yeah. got and again yeah just like the I guess that kind of leads into the title about burning like there's loads of different versions of it there's mm. the bit you know she talks about the spiritualism in Kenya and mm. she talks about obviously the suns the vast amount of sun that she gets in Kenya and then it sets and that's when she cries but yeah the burning of the sun the burning of the greenhouses and yeah, to the point which I don't really want to do the disservice by highlighting them all because it's just it's so buoyant it's, it's in, a, in, in such an effortless way as well I, like you said never heavy handed but no. always there well yeah, yeah exactly and this was why it just it took me a little while for all of it to slot in I even really liked that if, if light is what you're going for and yeah I mean inherently that involved burning but for Ben for Stephen Young's character his inability or his difficulty with feeling like real happiness when he euphemistically talked about what we believe to be him going out and murdering people he says that he burns greenhouses and it's like well he burns other people like he, he extinguishes other people's light to see if he can yeah, feel something. Yeah, yeah, feel feel something himself. It was because he needs to, he needs the sun a bit. You know, even though he has all the sun, is, mate. He, yeah, exactly. <laughs> even though he has all the sun he needs, he can't feel a fraction of what Jong Su feels as he's looking at that little piece of light, the warmth. And I think it's a damn shame that it didn't get into the Oscar Oscar like nomination categories. I'm trying to think uh, whether or not I preferred this to Shoplifters. The problem is, is but both of the movies had exactly the same problem for me, which was a pacing in the second half. Okay. So. It's really, really difficult for me to decide. I'm not sure if... I, I love them both, though. That's right. Do you want to, you want to lead, lead us out on some, some Gatsby? With Murakami and the way that he, obviously, he really enjoys Western literature, and I think in Norwegian Wood, his yep. favourite novel is The Great Gatsby. He talks about Gatsby and he talks about William mm. Faulkner, which he does in both of these. Yeah. In, in, in um, Burning as well. He loves Gatsby. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, no, but... And that's great. And I, oh, I know. I, I think I remember what it is. In, in, and again, in, Gatsby's all about sort of like looking across at the thing you don't have. At the, yeah. at the green light, yeah. yeah. I mean, this this is handy because it's something that you fucking study into ground into the ground at school. But if you're lucky like I was, and you had a teacher who really inspired you for it, you know, she was just like, this isn't this isn't just about like personal love or lust or fantasy. I mean, it's all inherited from the great lie of the American dream and how that was being felt at the time, and how Gatsby tries to inhabit this fiction that's not real and embellishes his past and I really enjoyed how they make an allusion to Ben being a bit Gatsby-esque in this but I also enjoyed and I spoke to Aaron about how Hamie embellished her past and talked about herself in a in a dishonest way and edited to make things the way that she wanted them to be. She exactly. wanted she wanted it to be a story. Yeah, you know, it wanted she wanted the poetry of him calling her ugly and then yeah. uh, her coming back beautiful. Mm. She wanted the poetry of him saving her from a well, a well that may or may not have existed. In um, and again, I, I want to talk about the, I want to talk about the well very quickly. Yeah, uh, no, please do. He talks to three different people about the well, and there's a bit of a, as with many things in this, there's a. Like the cat, which mm. he's feeding that may or may not exist. The murder that may or may not exist. There's yeah. a quandary about the well. And he gets three opinions. He gets the opinion of Jaime's parents, mm. who he goes to visit in a uh, in like a little cafe, yeah. essentially. Uh, who tell him that the well doesn't exist and that she never fell down the well. Mm. Um, the old a bit spitefully as well. They're just like, right. she's bullshitting you. Yeah, that she's... never happened. Uh, then he talks to the old man about it, who now owns the property. Mm. And he says, I don't think so. Mm. I think is that right? Yeah, he's not sure. He's yeah. like, I don't think that was ever yeah. a well. He's like, I don't think I. I think I'd know if there was a well, mm. which makes it yeah, makes sense. And then he talks to his mother, who says that there is a well. And I personally think that it's the connections between Jaime and his mother that mm. make them both remember or want there to be. Or like I said, I imagine that neither of them are lying. I imagine well, I imagine they neither of them are consciously doing it. It's mm. not from a malicious place. Yeah, they just really want there to be. And I, and I, I think the, the mother especially, it's almost like she decides she, to remember it. She is well. Yeah, she is like. Yeah, you know, she is just Jaime later down the line. Mm. Like she is, you know, once not oh, beauty has faded, but you know, what I mean, like once once you've realised it's all stopped mattering and all you have is credit card debt and broken yeah. dreams. Mm. Oh god, that that, that 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 is what she really represents, and it was bloody awful. I'm, mm. I'm glad that they put her in there, but it was it was probably one of the the biggest sucker punches of the of the film for me. Mm. Hammered at home. <laughs> that was really good. I, yeah, I was waiting for that to come to a head, and it did surprise me. So yeah, but, um, the phone calls. 
Any anything else? I mean, I think yeah, I think we could talk about this for a while. But no, I, I just, I, yeah, basically just, I think that as an inheritor of you know like Western literature's great criticisms of capitalism, of which there are many, and how tragic they always are, and how there's a, you know there's always like a character who represents like all of the wealth and how it ultimately just doesn't make them happy, and then the, you know this took that and went really really dark with it. So yeah, it was it was really good, and I'm glad we got to talk about it. Rather than you know, you know how Tolkien obviously talked about uh, the absence of light. Mm. This is almost what you what you do when you have all the light and it does nothing for you. Yeah, you uh, mm. what, what you try what you try and do. I and have, have to have some more with capitalism. There's never enough. And again, it just sort of reduces all these experiences. Like she's talking about this noble Kenyan experience, and um, the next girlfriend is talking about like Chinese people and their views on money. Yeah, yeah, and how they don't like money. And obviously, because they're a commun- yeah, communist country, mm. uh, which is vapid travel talk, though, isn't it? It's, yeah, exactly. It's uh, and that's all capitalism does. It reduces profound experiences into little marketable packages mm. for you to talk about with your fucking bullshit friends in your little Gangnam apartment. Yeah, the same Gangnam from Gangnam Style. Yeah, I was. Way. Yeah, I, I was. <laughs> it was good. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, no, fucking watch it. Mm. it I, you'll you'll not have a better time in February two thousand eight uh, nineteen. Unless maybe you go and see Green Book, which is apparently very good. Yeah. I'm not sure that that could possibly be better than this. No, but it's got more jazz in it. So yeah, I'm, I'm, that's I'm, true. I'm, I'm going... You have a very narrow metric, and I actually kind of respect that. So I mean, like, you know, most of the more accounting being going, that's all, I, that's all I want. The Chapman tropes. Um, yeah. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you. We will. Uh, Please remember to like and subscribe. And we'll be doing we'll be doing more more foreign films as it goes on. So stick yeah, around. Definitely. <laughs> all right. Nice one. Bye.